Hello, everybody. My name is Alex. Uh, welcome to Google Waterloo. So today we're, you, we're all here for a presentation from uh, Robert J. Sawyer, the accomplished sci-fi author. And I'll let him talk more. You don't want to see me, actually. Robert, <laughs> please welcome Robert. Thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much to uh, Google Waterloo for inviting me. I'm very, very grateful for that opportunity, um, particularly on two counts. It's actually the perfect venue for me to be speaking about uh, what I'm going to speak about because my new novel, Wake, is about the World Wide Web gaining consciousness. And you can't talk about or even conceptualize the World Wide Web today without reference to the good folks at Google. And the novel is set here in Waterloo. Uh, so this is just an ideal confluence of circumstances. Uh, Alex was abbreviated in his introduction, so I'm going to add one little comment that's sometimes said about me because it, it segues nicely into this. Uh, many years ago, the Montreal Gazette said that Robert J. Sawyer, me, is Canada's answer to Michael Crichton. Now, how do I know that that is true? Because I learned a great lesson from Michael Crichton. Way back, about 20 years ago, he and I read the same issue of Science News, which is a wonderful weekly uh, science mag uh, popular science magazine. There was a little tiny article in it, and it was about the fact that uh, some paleontologists and geneticists were predicting that someday it would be possible to clone dinosaurs from their blood preserved uh, in the bellies of insects that had fed on those dinosaurs during life. And me, I turned the page and said, isn't that cool? And Michael Crichton looked at that and he went off and wrote a book and made half a billion dollars from that. So the next time I saw something neat like that in the pages of New Scientist, it was an article that said, and this is probably a decade or so ago, that said sometime fairly early in the 21st century, the World Wide Web will have as many interconnections as does a human brain. Now, Michael Crichton, he just turned the page, and now, sadly, of course, he's no longer with us, but I thought, there's a book in that. And my first initial thought about this was that the World Wide Web uh, would automatically become conscious and self-aware. Why did I think that? Because when our own brains reached a certain threshold level of complexity, we became conscious and self-aware. And we know that that happened about 40,000 years ago. Some of you will be familiar with some of my books. One of them is a novel called Hominids, which won the Hugo Award for Best Novel of the Year. And it's about the fact that there was this thing in our own prehistory called the Great Leap Forward, which is where we sort of woke up, a, a dawned, consciousness dawned within us. And it happened about 40,000 years ago. We know that from the archaeological record. What part of the archaeological record tells us that? 40,000 years ago is when we started... Uh, adorning our bodies with jewelry and with makeup. And you only do that if you have a mental picture of yourself. You have to literally be self-aware to care about what other people are perceiving when they look at you. So we have a marker. That happened. Brains reached a sufficient level of complexity, presumably because of a sufficient number of interconnections within the brain, the neural nets of the brain, and consciousness emerged. There's this line in this popular science article I'm reading that says, we're going to have a thing on this planet that isn't human with a comparable level of complexity sometime, let's say, between 2010 and uh, 2020, as complex as the human brain. And I thought, okay, it's a no-brainer, so to speak. There's going to be a conscious, not just a sophisticated, but actually a self-aware World Wide Web. And I set out to write that book. And I spent a couple of years beating my head against the wall trying to write that book and make a um, scenario that was believable for me. Because I realized as I was approaching this question that the big fundamental difference between us and the World Wide Web is there were, even 40,000 years ago, there were hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of homo sapiens, and there, all of them lived in communities. In fact, you would have died if you weren't part of a social network. Social networking is not a new phenomenon. It's only a new phenomenon in the online world. Whereas the World Wide Web is a single entity. And that threshold that I was alluding to, the, what um, developmental psychologists call Theory of mind. Theory of mind, it's an awkward name because it doesn't really describe what it is. But theory of mind is the recognition that it happens in 
uh, a developing mind that other people have minds. It really should be called theory of other minds, the recognition that what I perceive of the world, which is a room full of people, um, is not what you perceive of the world, which is one guy with a couple of TV monitors uh, behind him. It's that recognition, which doesn't come immediately upon birth, but does come just about the time we start to be able to remember our lives, i.e. the start of our being essentially fully aware conscious beings, would be a very difficult thing for the World Wide Web to have happen to it if it existed in isolation. And I want to underscore that because most of the people prior to me, most of my colleagues who I I know many great, wonderful people, and most of them are my friends, uh, who've approached the problem of artificial intelligence, I think missed an obvious truth, which is although the World Wide Web has hooked up to it, a hundred million webcam eyes, and maybe even as many as a billion microphones these days hooked up to the World Wide Web, and there are countless uh, documents on the World Wide Web and so forth, none of that would be accessible to a consciousness that just supervened, that, that came into existence on top of the complexity of the World Wide Web. None of it would be, it would be aware of none of that any more than you as a developing consciousness in your mother's womb was aware of the fact that uh, the University of Waterloo has a huge library just over there or that there's uh, all, almost every book ever written is now available on Google Books, for instance. None of that impinged on your consciousness because you did not yet have an infrastructure for mediating with that stuff that was also part of the same world you existed in. So a dawning consciousness, if complexity were sufficient for the dawn of consciousness, would still not bring the World Wide Web the instantaneous ability to go and absorb everything that's in Wikipedia, for instance. So there was a problem there. The one model we had of, of consciousness dawning wasn't just the result of sufficient complexity, which was all that article that, uh, that Crichton and I both presumably read referred to, but also being a multiplicity of entities. So you could get this notion, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, actually comes out of we think therefore we are. I recognize there are others, therefore I recognize there we are. I, I am myself. And in fact, in consciousness studies, uh, we have this thing that's called the mirror test, which is very commonly used to determine where we have the threshold between sophisticated consciousness in animals and unsophisticated consciousness in animals. Now, say this fine fellow right here falls asleep during my talk, which there's a, a reasonable chance it might happen. And while he's asleep, we daub some red paint on his forehead. And then when he wakes up, we hold a mirror to his face. What will he do? He, because he's a conscious, sophisticated human being, will reach up to his own forehead and try to remove the red paint because he recognizes a picture of himself. Do that with chimpanzees. They'll do exactly the same thing. Do that with gorillas and most other animals, and they will reach forward because they think they're seeing another, but not themselves. They don't have an internal mental picture, and try and rub the red paint off of the other person's forehead. The idea of being able to recognize yourself comes from being aware that there are others in the mirror test and all of that. So what I had is this problem is that Tim Berners-Lee's Tim Berners great invention, the World Wide Web, was in fact designed right from the beginning to be a single entity, to connect every uh, originally documented in journal, but ultimately everything that could be given an address on the planet into one thing. How do you get consciousness out of that? And in my novel, Wake, which is what I'm sort of going to use as my springboard for the discussion here of consciousness, I had to contrive a way for there to be more than one World Wide Web. So the World Wide Web could have something to react to for consciousness in it to actually become self-aware. And... Um, I said you can't talk about the World Wide Web without talking about Google. That's very true. And Google has this great motto, do no evil, which is a wonderful, or don't be evil, which is a wonderful motto. There are others who are major forces in the World Wide Web who don't share that particular ethic. One of those is the government of China, which thinks, in fact, that the World Wide Web must be controlled and constrained, for instance. And so I contrive in the context of my novel uh, a reason why the Chinese government would choose for a period of time to strengthen uh, the Great Firewall of China, which is the already existing barrier they have between the outside world 
and the people of China uh, getting access to information so that if you, you know, search on terms the government doesn't want you to search on, you either get nothing or you get something banal when you're in, in China. Uh, and they do this, the reason they do this is not because they want to control what the Chinese people can say amongst themselves, but actually they want to control what outside information is pouring into China. And I contrive a situation in my novel, and you can read it. It's very exciting, very dramatic. You should read it because of that. But <laughs> the point that's germane here is that the World Wide Web gets temporarily cleaved into two halves. And very roughly, when you're talking about China and the rest of the world, we often use the phrases the West and the East, or the Western Hemisphere and the Eastern Hemisphere. And this brings me to what I was really grappling to try and find in terms of a metaphor that made sense for the dawn of consciousness in the World Wide Web. Now, what's fascinating to me here uh, is how young so many of the people are who work at Google. And whenever I meet somebody who's like 30 at Google, and I was just down at the Googleplex, uh, um, I guess, last month also, so the headquarters as well, they all in their 30s say, and oh, I'm an old guy here, right? So a lot of the people today probably aren't as familiar with this book as my generation was, but in the late 70s, a wonderful book was published called The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind by Julian Jaynes. As one of my characters says in, in uh, the sequel to Wake, you're making that title up. No, I'm not. It's a real book. The Origin of Consciousness, the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. And what Jaynes' theory was way back then is, uh, well, I'll actually elucidate it by reading a little bit from Wake because my novels actually read like lectures. So why not save myself the trouble of writing a lecture by just reading you as... Now, if you don't happen to like lectures, that's okay because every once in a while I put a sex scene in my novels too. So there's something for everybody. But there are lectures. And my main character, Caitlin, who is the, the lovely young uh, lady, she's 15 years old on the cover of the book there, happens to be blind uh, at the outset of the book. And that's significant too. But she's been reading electronically with a braille, uh, electronic refreshable braille display, uh, the origin of consciousness and the breakdown of the bicameral mind. She's on a flight now actually to uh, Japan as she's doing this. Uh, she killed some time by having the screen reading software on her notebook computer recite some of the origin of consciousness and the breakdown of the bicameral mind to her. Julian Jaynes's theory was quite literally mind-blowing, that human consciousness really hadn't existed until historical times. Until just 3,000 years ago, he said, the left and right halves of the brain weren't really integrated. People had bicameral minds. Caitlin knew from the Amazon.com reviews that many people simply couldn't grasp the notion of being alive without being conscious. But although Jane's never made the comparison, it sounded a lot like, and I'll interrupt myself for a second here, because I needed to find a second metaphor. The one thing that I realized, unlike the Jurassic Park story, which is, you know, at some point in the not too distant future, it'll be possible for self-directed beings to decide to search for hunks of amber in which there might be fossilized insects that still have blood in their bellies, or uh, preserved blood in their bellies. And I'll just point out parenthetically that reptiles do have uh, nucleuses in their red blood cells, mammals are unique in not having nucleuses, so there's lots of DNA in reptile blood, uh, that they would clone, this would be a self-directed process, somebody would choose to do this. But the World Wide Web gaining consciousness, how could it choose to actualize this nifty idea without somebody doing it for them? And so what... Uh, what Caitlin comes to realize here, and as I said, she was blind, was, but although Jane's never made the comparison, it sounded a lot like Helen Keller's description of her life before her soul dawn. That's in quotes, because that's a phrase that Keller actually used, when Annie Sullivan, her teacher, broke through to her. This is a quote from Helen Keller. Google books aside, this one's actually in public domain and can be freely quoted. <laughs> Before my teacher came to me, I did not know that I am. I lived in a world that was a no world. I cannot hope to describe adequately that unconscious yet conscious time of nothingness. I had neither will or intellect. I was carried along to objects and acts by a certain blind natural impetus. I never contracted my forehead in the act of thinking. I never viewed anything beforehand or chose it. Never in a start of the body or a heartbeat did I feel that I loved or cared for anything. My inner life, then, was a blank without past, present, or future, without hope or anticipation, without wonder or joy 
or faith? This is Caitlin's musings again. If James was right, everyone's life was like that until just a millennium before Christ. As proof, he, James, offered an analysis of the Iliad and the early books of the Old Testament, in which all the characters behaved like puppets, mindlessly following divine orders without ever having any internal reflection. And when I set out to try and find out what the World Wide Web with a sufficient complexity might be like, two things stuck in my mind. First is um, the fact that Helen Keller said she could not, she herself could not describe what it was like to live in sensory deprivation and not actually have come to the, uh, the, the awareness of herself. Um, and that just sounded like a good writerly challenge to me. So I tried to write initial scenes from the point of view of the World Wide Web before it had actually solidified its consciousness, it had actually become uh, um, self-aware. And here's a little tiny taste of what that sounds like. An unconscious yet conscious time of nothingness. Being aware without being aware of anything. And yet... And yet awareness means awareness means thinking. And thinking implies a no, the thought will not finish. The notion is too complex, too strange. But still, being aware is satisfying. Being aware is comfortable. An endless now, peaceful, calm, unbroken, except for those strange flickerings, those lines that briefly connect points. And very occasionally, thoughts, notions, perhaps even ideas, but they always slip away. If they could be held on to, if one could be added to another, reinforcing each other, refining each other. But no, progress has stalled. A plateau, awareness existing but not increasing. A tableau unchanging except in the tiniest details and I think in fact this is the situation we might end up with with the World Wide Web being hugely complex but no way for it to we have this term in computing which is called booting where does the term booting come from It comes from an old old metaphor about pulling oneself up by one's own bootstraps boots don't even have straps anymore but they used to have straps so that you could pull the boot on and the metaphor was that you could lift yourself off the ground by pulling on your bootstrap, which of course was an impossible thing uh, ever, but that's where we get the metaphor of booting up comes from. You lift yourself up by your bootstraps. And what I came to realize as I was writing this is I don't think the World Wide Web will emerge to consciousness by booting itself up. It will reach this tableau, this plateau I just spoke of, and stop dead. It is not something that can happen in isolation, I don't think. I think it's going to require exactly what Helen Keller required. Helen Keller required a teacher, a mentor, this wild, uh, untamed child's body. Uh, and in the case of the World Wide Web, in this vast infrastructure, which clearly has the complexity on which consciousness might supervene, but will not of its own volition, uh, intelligence out of a lab in Silicon Valley or, uh, or here in Waterloo because somebody designed it from the ground up, or if it's going to be drawn forth from an existing infrastructure, it will require somebody attempting to bring it forth, I think. And that actually is, a, to me, a, a comforting prospect that we don't really have to worry about the World Wide Web waking up without us wanting it to. Um, now, how does the World Wide Web physically become conscious? It's an interesting question to me. And I actually was very fortunate a couple of years ago that at the Googleplex in Mountain View, California, Google, along with Nature, the International Scientific Journal, and O'Reilly Publications, sponsored an event which has now become an annual event, but the first one, uh, which was called Sci Fu Camp. Uh, which was Fu, F-O-O, -O, in this context is Friends of O'Reilly, the computer publisher, and they invited, and I was gratified to be one of them, the hundred brightest people they could find to go and give little talks to each other about whatever they were interested in. And I got to go to the Googleplex and get a little seminar room, and I put on a board where we all put what our topics were going to be, uh, World Wide Web Gaining Consciousness, science fiction writer writing novel on that theme, Come Help Brainstorm, or words to that effect. And among the people um, who uh, uh, came uh, were um, Larry Page, uh, one of the co-founders of Google, came and sat in my talk, which was wonderful. Greg Bear, one of my great science fiction writing colleagues, people from Sun Microsystems and Microsoft and so forth. And it was absolutely wonderful to have that brain trust there. Because the big problem 
is when you think of something that's not human, of becoming conscious, where does the consciousness actually reside? Consciousness isn't, you know, souls. It isn't, it isn't immaterial. It is a physical process in this universe. And there has to be some either chemical or electronic or something thing going on. And I was very, very interested in what might actually be the way in which consciousness would be instantiated in the World Wide Web. And that means, in part, having a theory of how consciousness is instantiated inside of us. And again, I talk about the fact that as Googler people go, I'm, a, I'm an old guy, because I started university in 1979, before, before most Googlers were born. I did a minor in psychology, minor in psychology, during which never once was the word consciousness mentioned in class. There was no science of consciousness. If that term was ever used, it was a code word for Eastern mysticism. It wasn't, in fact, uh, a scientific discipline. It wasn't a topic that uh, neuroscientists dealt with. It wasn't a topic that cognitive theorists dealt with. It wasn't a topic that artificial intelligence researchers dealt with. There was no science of consciousness, in large measure because we had no really good way of looking inside brains while they were still working. You can slice and dice them to your heart's content, but that kills the subject. We didn't have functional MRIs of that time. We didn't have a basis for a science of consciousness. Now we do have a lot of competing theories about consciousness. And I got to say, I have a really, as all science fiction writers do, we have a fondness for the academics who are not in the mainstream, but are near the periphery, but are still highly credible. I should say that Julian Jaynes, who I was alluding to earlier, taught at Princeton. This is not a guy who was a, a flake working at outside uh, academia. This was a guy at a major university. And I'm very interested in the work of Roger Penrose. Roger Penrose collaborated with Stephen Hawking on major work uh, related to black holes. Uh, Penrose is the Roos Ball Professor of Mathematics um, at Oxford, uh, extremely credible mathematical physicist. And he wrote a great book. Anybody know the title of his book? The Emperor, the Emperor's New Mind? The Emperor's New Mind. Uh, and a sequel to that, which was called? Shadows of the Mind, which was even more interesting, because we sort of had taken as a given that, in fact, neural nets, this was so hot, I remember the 1980s, I used to make a good part of my living writing computer journalism in the 80s, neural nets were the hot topic. Everybody said, that's what it is. Intelligence is neural nets in humans and in computers, and if you just model the networking of neurons, you'll be able to predict the stock market. Well, we saw how well that's gone in the last couple of years. Uh, everybody, every business will become a great success. Well, it looks like today, isn't it, the GM? has announced that they're doomed to bankruptcy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was all neural nets. And Penrose did not think it was neural nets, that the seat of sophisticated consciousness in human beings was not the connections between uh, the neural nets or the, the, the mapping of the synapses in, uh, between the neurons in your brain. He thought it was something else. He didn't know what, but he knew it needed to be not a classical physical system, but he felt a quantum mechanical physical system. He had no mechanism in mind when he wrote The Emperor's New Mind. He just said, based on, among other things, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, it probably is quantum, not classical in nature, the way self-reflective consciousness has to work, because it requires axioms that cannot be proven within the context of the system for consciousness to work. Very interesting. Um, he was contacted after that first book came out by, of all professions, an anesthesiologist named Stuart Hameroff. And Hameroff said, you know, I'm really fascinated by consciousness because my job is reliably shutting it off. You know, I do my job well when I can turn off your consciousness. I do it even better when I can turn it back on after the operation is finished. If I fail in my job, you feel excruciating pain while the operation is being performed. And if I really fail, you just die. If I do my job well, I can actually shut consciousness off and turn it back on. And clearly he has done that in a way that most, you know, we talk about losing consciousness when we fall asleep, but we don't really, right? Uh, we dream, we have all sorts of sophisticated mental states going on. And um, uh, conscious dreaming is a conscious state. It's not a it's not a, a aware of the outside world state particularly, but it's a conscious state. But if you actually have, uh, are put under, as we say, put under with anesthesia, you don't know if you were under for one second or for two days. You don't know. They're, the consciousness is literally shut off for the duration. And he said, and I know what, what's happening, said Hammerhoff. You've got to look at not 
the neurons, but you got to look at the cytoskeletons of the tissue that makes up the brain, uh, which contains things. Uh, the cytoskeletons are made out of um, uh, a material called tubulin, and uh, tubulin uh, has uh, two states that um, they call tubulin dimers. Uh, and the bottom line is that they behave when you are conscious in a quantum mechanical way. That is, they're indeterminate in their state. And when I put you under, they they collapse into a classical system where they're not indeterminate. When they're behaving under the laws of quantum physics, you are self-aware. If I, with my chemicals, impede the physical ability of them to do that, you become unconscious, non-conscious. And when the uh, quantum activity returns, consciousness resumes. And I thought this was fascinating. And uh, I was also fascinated, again, I'm aging myself here, but. Uh, and when I was an undergrad and even before that, John Conway came up with a thing called the Game of Life. Anybody know the Game of Life besides the Milton Bradley version? The Game of Life was this wonderful discovery that with very simple rules, you could get things that are on a chessboard or a checkerboard to uh, have very complex behavior emerge from them. Uh, the classic example of the Game of Life is where you indeed have a chessboard and you have black and white uh, or red and black checkers or whatever on the chessboard and every time you take a turn in the game all the the playing pieces on the board change if a certain condition prevails at the time you say now and often that now if you have a, 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 um, a checker on a chessboard it has eight neighbors three above three below and one left one right right and you could have the rule be if three or more of your neighbors are black turn black if you aren't already otherwise stay red Simple rule like that and just keep applying that rule over and over again and enormous complexity that clearly could not have been coded into the, the one or two lines of code that required uh, the computer program to do that emerges, including shapes that actually retain cohesion and move across the chessboard as if they are living things. It's a fascinating, fascinating process. And I became really fascinated by that. And the more I look into it, the more I actually... Uh, happy to take the position, although I won't defend it to the death, that human consciousness is probably related to, cell these things are called cellular automata, cells being the basic unit of information, they're not cellular in the biological sense, uh, and automata meaning that they're simply going through a process over and over again without any conscious thought, cellular automata, that our consciousness probably is these uh, little chemical things that Hammerhoff pointed out, uh, flipping their states constantly in response to some rule. We don't know what the rule is or what's imposing the rule, but that's what consciousness is. And I looked for a way for the World Wide Web to have something analogous to that in it. And I spent a lot of time talking to uh, people who work in networking, people who work in you know backroom stuff, um, back office stuff for the web and so forth, talking to guys with Sun Microsystems and things like that. And again, I'm not going to defend this to the death. My job as a science fiction writer is not, after all, to accurately predict the future, but to come up with an interesting prediction that is not at least easily dismissed. And what I contrived for uh, the, the World Wide Web in my novel is uh, that, as you know, the, the World Wide Web communicates by sending packets between point A and point B, except they almost never go from point A, the source, to point B, the destination. They go all over the place, bouncing all over the place, and eventually ending up in their destination. And if two or more packets arrive at the same destination at the same time, one arbitrarily, uh, quite literally randomly, gets rejected and another one gets to arrive. And so packets bounce around the internet for a period of time, and after a certain number of bounces or hops, they're supposed to expire and ideally be deleted so they don't clog bandwidth. Um, but it's conceivable to me, and was conceivable to a number of the networking experts that I spoke to, that there could be sufficient flaws in our infrastructure of the World Wide Web and sufficient room for actual evolution in the Darwinian sense of mutant packets who would never expire bouncing around the web constantly, that there would be a wash of material moving around in the background of the web that isn't accounted for, isn't rooted anywhere, but keeps moving about and doesn't expire, normally after 255 hops, uh, because that's the maximum length you could normally code for in a hop counter, they would disappear. These ones don't, they never decrement to zero. And even if there was only a tiny, tiny percentage of the routers uh, that are the devices that bounce packets around on the web that allowed or created these flawed packets, there could still be 
trillions of them because, you know, there is, well, to coin a phrase, a Google's worth of packets floating around the Internet every day. Uh, and so these could actually become the cells, the checkers on the checkerboard of the backdrop of the World Wide Web and might, just as Hammerhoff and Penrose proposed, be a substrate on which consciousness might actually physically be instantiated both in human minds and in the World Wide Web. And given that they're analogous systems, given that they're, they're highly similar, um, it's one of the things uh, that, that people argue about is, could there be consciousness but not like our consciousness? Would we even recognize another consciousness? Is it unfair? for us to say that a rock is not conscious um, just because it isn't actually responding to anything that we say to it. Maybe we're just not interesting to it. It's an interesting question. It's a semantic question, but I actually don't think we have any particular reason to believe, except that it's a cool thing to play with, that there could be consciousness radically different than our consciousness. And to take a, an example that's common in science fiction is life, but not as we know it. Well, if you talk about life as being carbon biochemistry, doing certain specific organic interactions, sure, you can imagine all, other, all kinds of things that aren't based on those principles that are, in fact, life. Conway's game of life, which happens on a computer instead of in the, I'm looking at a grassy field out the window here, um, does seem to, in a lot of circumstances, emulate what life is. And if you emulate something perfectly in the digital world, well, it is that thing. It isn't a copy. It's the thing. Um, so that the idea that you could have life that isn't carbon, sure. The idea that you could have life that doesn't actually respond to stimulus, that isn't um, uh, driven by natural selection, that doesn't reproduce, which is a necessity for natural selection, uh, and all that list, laundry list of things that we have as definition of life that you all learned in high school biology class, have none of those things and still be life. That's not being open-minded or thinking big concepts. That's, frankly, just being silly. If you decide that anything can be life, then you've robbed the word life of any semantic meaning. Life is very specifically those things that respond to the Darwinian imperative, those things that respond to stimulus, those things that have motility in most cases, et cetera, et cetera. We have this laundry list. And I think consciousness also has a laundry list, a checklist of things that if you say, well, you know, it, it doesn't have any of those things, but it's still conscious. And the classic example of that, when we talk about the World Wide Web, is uh, Deep Blue, the computer that beat Garry Kasparov at chess. Now, who's the better chess player, Garry Kasparov or Deep Blue? Demonstrably, Deep Blue. It can beat Garry Kasparov, no question about that. Which one is more conscious? I mean, in fact, it's not even a comparative degree. Only one of them is conscious. Deep Blue has no self-awareness whatsoever, does not know that it was playing chess, certainly didn't know that it was humiliating uh, a grandmaster, took no joy in what it was doing, and if you asked it to do anything else other than play chess, something that Kasparov could have easily taken the principles of chess and applied to any other task in his life, um, it couldn't do anything. It would completely and utterly fail. In, in no meaningful way was Deep Blue conscious. It was sophisticated, and you could say, if you want to use that word in, a, in this way, that it was smart, but it wasn't conscious. It was not self-aware. I do think that uh, not just having similar infrastructure for consciousness in the World Wide Web as perhaps we have in our own brains, but also that consciousness will, in fact, give rise to a lot of similar feelings, feelings, emotions. Um, the number one thing that goes with theory of mind is, in fact, empathy, is, in fact, having an awareness of somebody else's feelings. That's exactly what empathy is. You are aware that that person is perceiving something differently than how you are perceiving it. Empathy. And if, in fact, I'm right in my chain of reasoning, which I've been very cursory in here and go over in a great detail in the novel uh, Wake uh, and its sequels, Watch and Wonder, that, uh, that consciousness requires more than one thing to be there, to interact with, um, then in fact empathy is going to be a cornerstone of consciousness. Uh, the part that we have that makes us unpleasant is not 
our consciousness. The part that we have that makes us unpleasant is our Darwinian heritage. It is evolution that has made humanity competitive. It is evol and competitive in a negative sense of the word, not that, you know, competition is bad in business, but it's evolution that has made us want to advantage ourselves and our uh, close relations at the expense of others. We're happy to see people half a world away starve. We don't give it any thought most of the time because it is not affecting our genes. That has nothing to do with our consciousness. Uh, it has to do with being part of the Darwinian tree of life. Evolution is not just survival of the fittest, it is in essence survival of the nastiness. The worst of what we are is what we share with every other life form on the planet that only cares about itself. You almost never see real altruism in the animal kingdom. When we have altruistic behaviors, there are a lot of evolutionary psychologists and others who try to dismiss them by finding a way to plug them into the Darwinian paradigm and say they aren't really altruistic behaviors. If I just met Alex for the first time today, here's Alex uh, Komen is one of my hosts here today, um, that if I do something nice for Alex today, and we're not, we're not blood relatives, that the reason I'm doing that is not because I'm a nice guy or perhaps Alex needs some help and I'm just responding to that. It's because I'm hoping somewhere down the road there will be reciprocal altruism, which is, again, like defining life not as we know it. It robs the concept of altruism of any meaning. There's no such thing as reciprocal altruism. There's altruism, doing something for the sake of doing good. Reciprocal altruism is just a business transaction. I do this for you now because I'm going to call in the favor later. And yet evolutionary psychologists will argue that reciprocal altruism, that they use that term, reciprocal altruism, as a way of making altruism into a non-existent commodity. And indeed, it seems true that we are overwhelmed by our Darwinian heritage. But the value, if there is any, of an emergent consciousness that emerges solely from the interaction with others, from that theory of mind moment, from the recognition that because there's somebody else, then I also exist. Because there's not me, there is me, and because there's communication between us that I can learn how to communicate and conceptualize. Nobody ever developed language for thinking thoughts with themselves. They developed language for communicating with others. All of that is a very positive legacy. The positive parts of humanity come from our consciousness. The negative parts of humanity come from the fact that we share four billion years of competitive evolution to get Scraw, a, a scramble in nature red in tooth and claw to the top, as it were, of the food chain. If we can have life in the sense, and I don't care if it's interactive or not, we can have consciousness in a sense that's um, devoid of having evolved something that emerges on something that doesn't have a past history like the World Wide Web, I think we actually stand a chance of it actually being a benign and positive experience for us. And why I felt compelled, I'm going to wrap this up, why I felt compelled to make this trilogy of books was because I felt that my field, science fiction, had to some substantial degree abrogated its social responsibility. Science fiction is very much a genre about presenting possible futures, and we do not have a scorecard, each of us authors, about which, which of our predictions came true, because in fact, in many cases, we would be mortified if our predictions came true. George Orwell, the last thing he wanted was the real 1984 to be like his 1984. And the fact that we did not have a big brother in 1984 and don't yet have a big brother, uh, Homeland Security notwithstanding, uh, in 2009 uh, is a great testament to the power of science fiction. Here's a future that's plausible. Do you want to go down this path, or maybe you want to make a course correction? Science fiction, um, I think, has failed to give us many plausible futures in which the advent of superior non-human intelligence is not the automatic death sentence for humanity. Uh, we talk about the post-human era as if, you know, humanity is about to come to an end. The singularity, this great wall at which it's going to be somebody else who's going to take over uh, and not be us. Uh, as it happens on the, on the uh, day that I'm speaking here, 
Terminator Salvation just opened on the preceding weekend. Uh, and the Terminator series is all about the machines deciding they would be better off without us. And the Matrix is all about machines deciding they would be better off without us being aware of them and they would use us as batteries in some bizarre that, that doesn't make much sense when you think about the Matrix. But it was not a positive scenario. Virtually every computer Captain Kirk ever fought was bent on either insane or bent on the destruction of humanity or, if not subjugating us, and this was a common science fictional theme, smothering us with their kindness. Uh, in science fiction, everybody knows about Asimov's laws of robotics, the first of which is a robot may not injure a human being or allow a human being to come to harm. Jack Williamson, around the same time, had a similar prime directive for his humanoids, which were robots, to serve and obey and guard men from harm. But it was always that and not allow to come to harm where we ended up with the ultimate nanny state, where we ended up with no human liberty. Even when robots were benign, they loved us to death. They would not let us go skydiving or ski, uh, skiing or, or uh, here's a guy out the window here riding a, motor, uh, a, a bike without a helmet on. They wouldn't let any of that happen because they couldn't allow us to come to harm. What I thought science fiction needed to provide was a roadmap into the coming decades in which for sure, for sure, there'll be things smarter than us on this planet and may well be things that are also conscious on this planet that are smarter than us. A roadmap, a possible future where we would survive with our essential individual individuality, liberty, humanity, and dignity intact. That's what I set out to do in writing Wake, Watch, and Wonder. And hopefully, hopefully, it'll be part of the discourse as we prepare, which is what science fiction's job is to do. We're advanced scouts for the future. So here's what we saw when we went up ahead. Do you want guys want to follow me or do you want to follow that scout over there? Hopefully, this will all become part of the discourse as we prepare for that day when there will be a conscious World Wide Web. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I had a simple question, which is that you seem to isolate the origin of consciousness in the human brain as being the quantum mechanical effects of the tubules, which were these dimers, as you mentioned. And then you somehow made the switch into packets going in loops in the internet, but there's no quantum mechanical anything going on there. So what did That's I miss? That's true. You've got to read the book, because it's too long to describe the physics behind it. There is no the, – the, one of the reasons the novel is set I'll, – I, 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 the, first, I, did you get that on the mic, what the question was, or should I repeat it? Okay, what is the quantum mechanical element of consciousness in the World Wide Web model that I just described? And the answer is, I'm not going to tell you right now because it's, it's um, part of the drama of the trilogy. Um, the reason it's set here in Waterloo, among all the other good reasons, is that one of the main characters is a, a quantum gravity researcher at the Perimeter Institute here. And so that is a key part of, indeed, working out what is the indeterminacy, the quantum indeterminacy that can be reflected in the macro structure of packets moving around on the World Wide Web. You raise a very good question. And I'm not going to tell you how Lost ends either. But believe me, there's a good ending, we hope. <laughs> Somebody else? Okay, so on that note, a lot of your books are very Canadian. They're all they're set in Canada. Yes, you you clearly you're a Canadian writer. Um, so first of all, well, why did you choose to do this, and two, does it hurt you internationally? The question was, uh, I'm a Canadian writer. My books are blatantly, flagrantly, uh, flamingly Canadian, and does that hurt me internationally? Why did I choose to do that, and does it hurt me internationally? And uh, I'm grateful for the question. So don't take this the wrong way, but. It always astonishes me when I'm asked that question. I cannot conceive of Robert B. Parker, who writes the Spencer mystery novel set in Boston, having given a talk, say, not at, at Google Waterloo, but say at the campus of MIT, have somebody in the audience say to him, now, why the heck do you set your books in Boston? His answer would be the same as mine. That's where I live. That's what I know. That's what I love. Why wouldn't I set them, right? It would never occur. It's a very Canadian phenomenon. It would never occur anywhere else in the world to ask a writer, why on earth do you set your books where you live? Why don't you hide that fact and set them somewhere else? It, it, it's an astonishing part of it. It's not unique to you. I hear this question all the time. It's an astonishing part of our national character to think that nobody could possibly be interested in us. <laughs> Google, the most powerful company arguably on the planet and certainly one of the most important, has Google Waterloo. 
clearly, you know, uh, Larry and Sergey thought there was something going on up here. The Perimeter Institute is here. Stephen Hawking is coming here to study at the Perimeter Institute. Um, as I said uh, in an article that ended up being on the front page of the uh, Waterloo Region Record, the newspaper here, um, I could not have made up Waterloo. Nobody would believe me if I had written a town where one of the top computer science departments in the entire world is located, where Google happens to have a facility, where the one device that President Barack Obama said he couldn't live without is manufactured right over there, Research in Motion, the BlackBerry, that one of the world's leading centers for quantum computing is located, where Stephen Hawking is going to leave Oxford behind to come and do his studies. Uh, where the leading, you know, theoretical think tank for quantum physics, not to mention a great think tank for international policy, would all be in a town of a little more than 100,000 people. And oh, by the way, it'd be surrounded by Mennonites, the least technically advanced <laughs> people on the planet. If I had made that up, people would, uh, if I, I couldn't make that up, people would accuse me there's no such place. Yes, there is. Canada has wonders enough, uh, as Q said in the pilot of Star Trek The Next Generation, to satiate appetites subtle and gross. There's more here to write about than I will ever finish mining. Has it ever hurt me internationally? No. And yet every time I, when, when I, every time I said I was going to do this as a beginning writer, every writer I met in Canada said to me, you'll never sell your books in the United States if you set them in Toronto or, or Waterloo or wherever I've set books. And uh, I am, as my character of Caitlin in the novel Wake keeps saying, she's only 15, she keeps saying, I'm an empiricist at heart. Show me the evidence, the experimental evidence that that's actually true. And I asked people to show me the, the, the wannabe writers, the failed writers with the tin cups on the street corners in Toronto begging to make a living because they had so completely failed because they'd foolishly set a book in Toronto instead of Chicago. Nobody could show me that it had ever been tried and failed. So I decided to try it, and never once in this is my 30th year of being a published science fiction writer, a professional writer, and my uh, 19th year of being a novelist, never once as an American critic, editor, publisher, academic, bookseller, or reader ever complained about the Canadian content of my books. My books are in 15 languages worldwide. I am the most popular non-Chinese science fiction writer in China. I was actually given an award to be for that. Uh, and all over the world, my books are read and enjoyed, and nobody except Canadians ever thinks it's a bad idea for them to be <laughs> Canadian. Somebody else? So just kind of going back to the consciousness uh, discussion, you mentioned earlier that in the digital world, an, you know, an exact imitation isn't an imitation. It is right. what it is. Right. So looking at consciousness, is it or do you feel that it's possible that there is a potential for an imitation of consciousness based upon storage, semantic analysis, yes. these kinds of things that – based upon imitation being actual, could actually be then another form of consciousness. Yes. Yes, Omar asks a very good question. Um, there is in philosophy, a philosophy of mind, a concept of the philosopher's zombie. The philosopher's zombie is somebody who does every, it, it doesn't suck blood or anything like that. It's somebody who does every external behavior uh, that we would associate with a conscious entity. But in fact, there is no consciousness in operation. We all, from time to time, behave like uh, philosopher zombies. We will drive home from work and have no conscious recollection of having done it. Our consciousness will be, we say, preoccupied. It'll actually be otherwise occupied, stewing over the fight you had with your boss or thinking about what you're going to do with your kids in the evening. And the very sophisticated process of operating a motor vehicle will happen without conscious thought. And if you, that can happen some of the time, by extrapolation it could happen all of the time, the world could in fact be populated uh, by things that appear to be conscious and are not conscious. And that's the problem in modern philosophy of the philosopher's zombie. How do you know that that isn't the world that we live in? And how do you know indeed that it doesn't all devolve down to solipsism, that I'm the only conscious entity and all of you, he's nodding knowingly, or has he just got an algorithm inside him that says nod periodically at the guy who's speaking, right? <laughs> Which is going on here? Is he conscious or is he not conscious? We don't have any way to know except his affirmation. Kagito ergo sum, he says. And I say, oh, okay, he knows the magic words. He must be conscious. So what do we have ultimately is the last vestiges of mysticism in Western philosophy because it's always that point. And I, I lighted over it quite click, quickly there in my talk about whether or not a, a something that you make a digital copy of is in fact that thing if the copy is made with enough fidelity. 
can you in fact copy consciousness? Uh, I was lucky enough to win the John W. Campbell Memorial Award, which is the top juried award in science fiction for a book called Mind Scan, which was about scanning consciousness. And it has what I think is my only significant or certainly most significant contribution to the philosophical discourse of consciousness uh, in a debate between a philosopher and a lawyer, because he's, on, he's being cross-examined, about whether or not, even if we have souls, you could get souls to go where the mind scan goes. The bottom line is we still retain this vestige of dualism, that they're really somehow down deep we want to think that there is something beyond the absolute physical in our consciousness. And people have even accused Penrose of that when he says, well, when you start talking about quantum mechanical hocus pocus, you are, as Einstein defer, uh, referred to quantum mechanics, a spooky action. You actually are invoking something supernatural as a way of keeping consciousness special, of being beyond Newtonian, all of that. I don't have a good answer for you, except that whenever I think about this logically, I come to the conclusion that consciousness has to be a, a, a phenomenon, measurable, observable, physical, perhaps quantum physical, but physical phenomenon in this universe with no mystical quality to it. There's no difference between consciousness and anything else that exists in the physical universe. I take that as an article of faith, as a rationalist, as an empiricist, um, but it is an article of faith. There are others who literally have as articles of faith that consciousness is the divine spark within us. Uh, and I just don't buy that. So if you make a really perfect simulation of consciousness, the word simulation no longer applies to it. It is consciousness. Uh, Alan Turing, of course, with the Turing test, basically said that. He said, if you can't tell, no matter how clever you are as an interlocutor, as a questioner, if I can't trip you up, by asking you a question that you don't respond as a conscious being might respond to it, then you must be conscious. I think that makes prima facie obvious intuitive sense. That must be true. And also, although we're in a lot of denial about consciousness, anybody who has a friend or a family member or has a friend or family member suffer, going through this, somebody who has Alzheimer's disease or dementia, uh, you watch as consciousness slips away in conjunction with the physical decay of the infrastructure of consciousness. When are, you know, we like to think we're all with it to the moment we die, and then maybe there is some intact package of consciousness. But in fact, in many, many people, now that we live long enough to not die spectacularly quick deaths, which is what people used to die, even from disease, fairly quick and without loss of cognitive function, now we live long enough for the brain actually to wear out. And we see in case after case after case that as the brain wears out, consciousness diminishes, uh, the cognitive functions disappear. It's innately and inexorably part of those physical processes. There's nothing beyond that to consciousness. And I think others will argue with me, but I think to deny that position is in fact denial. It's just wishful thinking. Somebody else? Remote sites, do you have any questions? Hey, other Google sites. I'll turn around and look at you. There's one guy. What is this? One guy. Hey, wave at me, one guy. Yeah, you. <laughs> okay, this guy. Hi, how are you? How many right, people in I your company worldwide? I get one. <laughs> Any questions? Does he have a question? He's talking. <laughs> All right, I who's here from mute. the Google uh, facial Hello, recognition remote team? Office? I think you're on mute. We can't hear you. Okay, sorry. Hi. Hear you yeah, go ahead. Hi. Hi. I'm an Australian, actually. I'm in the New York office, but uh, we have the same uh, phenomenon in Australia that you have in Canada. We call it the cultural cringe. I think it comes from being a... a, a a British colony. But um, actually, I had a comment about uh, Stephen Penrose's work. I mean, he, he his work based on, you know, this desire to inject quantum mechanics comes from a real misunderstanding of uh, Gödel's theorem. He, he sort of suggests that Gödel's theorem doesn't apply to uh, humans and in particular mathematicians because mathematicians are infallible. Um, and... Uh, you know, the reality is that mathematicians, just like the rest of us, are, are fallible. If they, if they exactly follow the rules, then, then they can be, uh, can be uh, much more, you know, then, then they're actually a formal system, and then they can be infallible, but, but, uh, but then, then, then Gödel's theorem does apply. So he, he sort of argues that because there are things that, uh, that formal systems can't prove, but which we can, uh, 
that uh, we must there must be something special about it. But I think he's just he's just really misunderstood how Gödel's theorem applies would apply to uh, computers that are actually conscious. It's an intro. Uh, yeah, I've heard people say that about it's Roger Penrose, not Stephen Penrose, but I've heard oh, people say that about him. And all I can say is he's Stephen Hawking's collaborator, and he's the Roos Ball Professor of Mathematics at Oxford, and he probably got A levels in all of his uh, tests. But uh, he, it's conceivable, I suppose, that he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he's clearly a very smart guy. I just think it's a it's a pity we have to still keep refuting his his failed arguments so so many uh, for such a long time. I mean, the the, the counter arguments are pretty straightforward and have been made, you know, immediately after his book came out. So uh, I think it's a shame people keep feeling the need to uh, inject uh, non-determinacy from quantum mechanics into into the into a process that you know, there's really no evidence that that uh, that sort of non-determinacy is required for consciousness. Well, it's interesting, of course, there are uh, the Tucson conference that's held every year or every other year, which is the major conference on consciousness studies, still has oodles of papers on uh, Hameroff and Penrose. So uh, in truth, yes, the scientific process does involve somebody putting something out, somebody else objecting to it. But to think then that's the end of it, to say that, well, you know, when Penrose first put this forward, somebody objected to his position and laid out... Uh, an alternative um, interpretation, and so we should stop the process, just isn't the way science works. Hammerhoff, Penrose himself, and others who are advocates of their position have certainly come back with papers and, and counter arguments and so forth. There's an ongoing debate here. Um, but fundamentally, the simplest solution to the issue is this, for you guys to go and make a classically deterministic device that exhibits consciousness. And when you do that, you'll be able to say there actually is no necessity for a quantum mechanical component. But since you've actually totally and completely, Deep Blue being the example, the most sophisticated computers on the planet, utterly failing to actually exhibit even the sm smallest smidgen of consciousness that we would associate uh, with most primates that are non-human, uh, leaves it still an open question. You can argue a position, but the, the really determinative response would be to say, here, I've done it as a classical physical process. And you guys haven't yet. <laughs> Somebody else? Um, so this is not continuing the other point, but still dealing with consciousness. So, you know, current experience with consciousness is related to, you know, as you mentioned, humans and chimpanzees. Both of those things are intimately coupled with life. And you had mentioned life in your talk. Right. Something like the World Wide Web uh, gaining consciousness is a bit of a different situation in that it may – there's a decoupling with life. So how did you deal with that experience of consciousness not being coupled with life, you well, know, just as a writer and then in general? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was a fascinating process, and that was all the stuff I was talking about related to Darwinian evolution having uh, influenced our characters to be uh, the way they are, and that the coupling from evolution with the spontaneous emergence of consciousness out of complexity resulting in possibly a very different uh, and hopefully more beneficent psychological set. I mean, that was indeed the point of what I was talking about there. Um, in terms of consciousness not being involved with life and trying to write a non-human consciousness, and indeed um, the emergence of the World Wide Web before it actually has plugged into Google and has started to be able to search and even understand symbolic reasoning, uh, uh, which is the precursor of understanding language, to be able to have a symbol that you can manipulate that means something in your brain that isn't the actual thing, um, was very, very difficult to do. And I did find, actually, uh, as I alluded in the, uh, in the comments I made, reading Helen Keller, her attempts to do this, enormously edifying. Her failure to be able to do it, in part, I think, had to do with the vocabulary of the time she was writing in. There was no uh, neurosciences vocabulary for her to draw upon to explain what she was experiencing. But it was an enormously interesting creative challenge. And given these are my 18th, 19th, and 20th novels, I have to keep looking for them, or else it would be a boring job, right? Um, and I'm not sure that, you know, I just I, I gave this guy a hard time and said, well, you show it to me. You show me um, a classical system that's actually conscious. Uh, he could come back at me and say, you show me any system that isn't living that actually has a smidgen of consciousness. And that would be a perfectly good retort, uh, except that my job is only to write 
the books that set the agenda for those who are going to ultimately go out and try and make these things happen in reality. Um, it was a very difficult psychological process to decouple my mind from what I was, was identifying as the processes, my own mental processes that were related to my evolutionary heritage. I don't know that I entirely succeeded, but I tried really hard and I had a lot of cognitive theorists and AI researchers vet the manuscript and think that I managed it in the novel wake, but it was a very, very interesting intellectual challenge to try to do. Somebody else? So I think one of the things I sort of noticed in the early parts of Wake that I've read, and I think it emphasized even more when you read the passage yourself of the consciousnesses speaking, um, is that it's very emotional. Yes. And you read it even more emotional than I would have ever read it myself, and that sort of changes the way I perceive it. Um, why emotion as opposed to logic? Because logic requires a symbolic reasoning system. If A, then B. And you have to have a way of assigning variables or assigning values to things that you're manipulating mentally. There's no doubt that babies are emotional way before they're rational. I mean, that's in fact the way consciousness is booted up biologically. And there certainly are, you know, all kinds of emotional animals that we would never say ever reach a level of rationalism. In fact, my opinion is that every dog that lives in a city is insane because the first time you take it into an elevator, the door closes and then it opens and the entire world has changed. And after that, you got to say, I give up. Nothing makes sense. And you just give up and you go on wagging your tail. You exist as an emotional entity and you have no intellectual ability anymore because the world makes no sense to you. And I think that's the reality of it, that, that feeling does certainly, and I, again, we get this very tricky issue of whether you can decouple uh, the evolutionary experience from the conscious experience. But feeling uh, is something that one can argue. We had, it's interesting, had some very interesting arguments with a, a, a computer a guy who works here in Waterloo and a cognitive scientist in the States going sort of back and forth about whether or not uh, computer programs have likes and dislikes uh, and whether or not something like a paramecium or an amoeba has a like or a dislike. Uh, if you rank possible outcomes from 1 to 10, are you in fact liking the high-ranked ones and disliking the low-ranked ones. Is that, in fact, fundamentally an emotional thing? Um, if a chess computer chess playing program says, well, this move looks really good, that move looks okay, this move is not good at all, does it like the move that it's going to be really good better than the one that it doesn't? When you take an amoeba, and if, uh, speaking just as an empirical example of the fact that probably our intelligence isn't tied up in neural nets, is you can actually get paramecia take it, uh, the example it's usually used, you can teach a paramecium. How do you teach a paramecium? It has no neurons. It is a single cell and that cell is not a neuron. How, there is no neural net in a paramecium. But if you have a paramecium and you devise a really small little Y bifurcated maze and you you have it, if it goes left, it gets food, and it goes right, it gets a acidic reaction or a shock. It will learn eventually. It'll take a lot of tries, no question about it, but it will learn to always go left. How has it done that? It is certainly relying on a model of, uh, of cognitive function that is utterly unrelated to the one that we think when we talk in our classical models about uh, the, the uh, um, intelligence and consciousness being in the neural nets of our brain, it is doing it uh, in a way that cannot, because it doesn't have that infrastructure be that way. But it does have, I will point out to my friend here, does have microtubules and cytoskeleton and tubulin dimers. Um, so to get back to your question, has the amoeba learned to like going left, the paramecium like going left and not like going right? One could argue that it actually is having an emotional response there. I do think that emotions predate uh, in our evolutionary history and probably in the ramping up to intelligence anything that might be called logic. There's a lot of argument that we make a mistake in trying to program intelligence. The AI community is making a mistake. Uh, because they're trying to do it in digital computers what we do if we do do it in the classical way with an analog computer. The, the brain is an analog, not a digital computer, unless we're talking about the microtubules. Um, and I think that also the argument that logic and reasoning predates and somehow that emotions supervene on top of that 
is exactly backwards to what our real experience, both in our own lives, of being emotional before we were rational, and in the history of, um, of life on Earth is, for what that is worth. Ah, somebody else. Yeah. It's actually a follow-up on the previous question. Um, so uh, as far as I know, emotions are largely based on neurotransmitters. That's an interesting question. We, the question was, are emotions are based on neurotransmitters? Some emotions are. I mean, there's no question that love, uh, in the romantic sense, is based on, uh, has a lot of neurotransmitter component to it. Part of it depends on how you define emotions and which emotions you're looking at. Um, I would never say that the paramecium loves getting the food and doesn't love getting the shock, but I would say it likes getting the food and doesn't like getting the shock. And one in us, you can, uh, the, when I said early on, uh, for instance, when I studied psychology, we never mentioned consciousness. Why not? Because B.F. Skinner still had held sway. It was all behaviorism. Put in the right input, you get the right output. Liking and disliking are the same as reinforced and extinguished behaviors in operant conditioning. They are our fundamental emotions don't necessarily require a neurotransmitter base at all. The more uh, rarefied, because as you, because you can teach a paramecium to like or dislike something, the more rarefied ones the ones that get us in the most trouble, romantic love, rage as opposed to dislike. Rage is probably highly mediated by, say, t testosterone, for instance, and, and neurotransmitters. Um, but dislike, I don't think, is necessarily neurotransmitter-based. We have a wide range of over-the-top emotions when our emotions, in fact, take control over our processes. When we do things that are really stupid for love or for anger, we're doing them because we're having a chemical cascade reaction of neurotransmitters. But I don't think all emotions or the basic emotions are, in fact, uh, neurochemical. One could argue that they are, but I would like to see uh, explanations for the behavior and things that don't have neurotransmitters in them, like single-celled animals that still develop preferences, unless you want to just dis semantically dismiss that preferences and liking and disliking are not the same thing. Hi, Jeff, if that is your real name. <laughs> I'll never tell. Um, you mentioned a couple of times that you're uh, minors in psychology. I'm just curious what the rest of your background is. Radio and television arts uh, is what I studied uh, at Ryerson in Toronto. I thought I wanted to be a script writer um, and um, ultimately decided no. And now, actually, I am, because uh, ABC is making a TV series based on my novel, Flash Forward, premieres this fall, Thursdays at 8 p.m., <laughs> and um, I am a creative consultant for that and writing one of the first 13 episodes and so forth, but that's, that's my background is as a broadcaster. Fight for it. Let your neurotransmitters <laughs> hold sway. Oh. So you mentioned Asimov's laws. I did. Um, there's a trend that I'm seeing recently about going the other way, having robot, you know, uh, not robot, like robot rights, you know, yes. treating the yes. robots in a humane manner, yes. these kinds of things. In general, what are your thoughts on that? And then in light of, you know, an artificial consciousness, if that, you know, if all of a sudden, let's say in 100 years, we can create a uh, quantum computer in a box, stick that on top of us, some um, Android's head. Right. Now we have consciousness, you know, in a very, you know, small, Absolutely. Office, uh, distributed internet consciousness, but actually something that is much more contained. Um, so in general, you know, human, or sorry, robot rights now and also going on into yeah. the future. Omar asks a great question. I was uh, extremely flattered and also extremely fortunate that Science, the world's leading scientific journal, asked me to write their uh, guest editorial for their robotics issue. And I think it was November 2007. And the issue, the topic of my editorial was roboethics. Uh, and this is a topic that interests me greatly. Uh, Asimov wanted to impose on robots essentially conditions of servitude. And what we have had throughout the civil rights movement going back not just to the 1960s in the United States, but right to the dawn of anybody saying you're not treating me fairly, is a broadening of the definition of who should be given rights. Very interesting right now, just yesterday, Barack Obama announced the first Hispanic 
uh, nominee to the Supreme Court of the United States and also a woman to be one of the very few uh, to ever have been put forth as a possible Supreme Court Justice of the United States. The founding fathers of the United States had no trouble at all saying we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, and by men they did mean men, not women. And they also meant white men who own property, not uh, people of color and certainly not non-property holders and all of that. They were quite content to have this great sentiment and yet see it in a very narrow way. Uh, just yesterday in the news also, California's Supreme Court upheld Proposition 8, which was the ban on gay marriage. That will fall. Uh, I am sure, because the history of the human race has been about expanding the definition of who rights are entitled, who is entitled to have rights, not subtracting them. And in fact, really, uh, the most contentious issue the Supreme Court judge will face is Roe v. Wade, which, as I always like the joke that says, no, those are not two ways to get across a river. They are, in fact, the fundamental uh, decision in the United States jurisprudence that gave a uh, woman the right to have an abortion on demand. Um, even that issue is about who has rights. Does the mother have rights? Does something that's not even born yet have rights? It's a very interesting question if you look at it in the context of this expanding definition of who is entitled to rights. And I have no question whatsoever that we will ultimately decide that anything that is conscious has human rights. It's an, it's a, it's a loaded term. We, in fact, need a better phrase than human rights for it. Um, I'm sure that we will decide that ultimately, but as with every time the definition has been expanded, when women were literally disenfranchised, meaning they did not have a vote, and became franchised, meaning they could own Kentucky Fried Chicken stores, or any other franchise they wanted to, or have a vote, happened with all kinds of protests and battles. Uh, for blacks to become citizens of the United States, all kinds of protests and battles. This will not come easily, but history has taught us that we prosper when people have more rights than fewer rights and more people have rights than don't have rights. Uh, and so I am convinced that we will ultimately uh, have a, a, all the, the same rights accorded to anything that is self-aware. Uh, and that will include the quantum computer in a box sitting on a robot body that you just referred to. But it will be an uphill battle. We, that is the history of the expanding definition of rights. It will be uphill, but it will be won as well. As the song goes, we shall overcome. Anybody else? All right. Let's thank Robert for his great speech. My pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.